Hello and welcome to Guiding Assets, the flagship investment podcast for CFA Institute. I'm Mike Wahlberg, and I'm happy to have Dr. Daniel Paris, CFA, on the show today. Daniel is a senior portfolio manager with Federated Hermes, a large U.S. asset manager, though he's more than an equity investor. A regular commentator for The Wall Street Journal, The New York Times, and Bloomberg, Daniel has also authored several books. He has a new one that was recently released called The Ownership Dividend, and I'm looking forward to our conversation about what he sees as a major paradigm shift in how U.S. investors think about and invest in dividend stock. So welcome to the show, Daniel. Mike, thank you so much for having me. I'm delighted to be here. So Daniel, in your book, you foretell the end of a 40-year paradigm in the U.S. in which dividend stocks, to quote the late great Rodney Dangerfield, they just don't get no respect. Why did U.S. companies and investors abandon dividends for those four decades? Yeah, it's when you're in the middle of a paradigm, it's hard to see that you're you're in the middle of a paradigm. You think everything is normal. And so I think for really at least two full generations of investors, gatekeepers, analysts, they come and see stocks, a significant, large, successful businesses without dividends. I think it's perfectly normal. You buy low, sell high, repeat frequently. Harvested capital gain is as good as anything else to fund consumption, et cetera. It's a normal state of affairs. Fortunately or unfortunately, I'm just not wired that way. And I uh, ended up in this uh, profession coming from uh, a completely different one. I was a historian of the former Soviet Union, but emphasis on the historian part. And uh, once I'd settled into this new profession, I found it a little bit strange that the first chapter of every single training program, CFA Institute or other, about the valuation or value of assets was about the cash flows available to the owners of said asset. And yet that chapter was completely ignored in practice. And it might have been easy to say, well, people are people, whatever. But as a historian, I went back to another, there must be, a, when did all of this happen? How did this happen this way? How did this, has it always been this way? Has, has the academy's conviction about discounted cash flows uh, simply never been reflected in reality? Or is there something that's anomalous? And pretty quickly after I transferred into the profession, I discovered there was something anomalous and that uh, assets being linked to their cash flows, current and future, is the normal state of affairs everywhere in time and space. And that particularly large successful businesses being unlinked to distributable cash flows is unusual to say the least. And so I began looking backwards. And my question when I see something is, well, where did this come from? What purpose did it serve? Does it still serve? Does it still make sense? And that led to a, a number of historical explorations. So there are several books out there. Thank you, Mike, for the pitches. But the most recent one looks at the really the last 30 years when dividends were pushed to the side, a very much unusual circumstance for large market investing, and it tries you know, best I could to explain why that happened. And more importantly for investors today in early 2024, why the reasons behind that shift have largely dissipated and that I do expect to see large companies, large successful businesses um, returning more to what I refer to as the cash nexus, linking a particularly minority shareholders, meaning non-majority shareholders to their assets through a cash relationship that is in the case of stocks, that, that is, is the dividend. So yeah, they went, went away. We'll get into the historical reasons, but I think now's a really interesting time, a shift period. Not everyone can see it. As a matter of fact, I'm getting lots of pushback. It's very interesting. Being a contrarian investor is becoming really, uh, I, I think being a dividend investor is not being contrarian, but apparently being a dividend investor in a stock committed market is very much so contrarian, but we shall see in the full course of time. So I wanted to ask about that. So, I mean, why is it that it's a, a specifically a US thing? Because I mean, these, these trends were happening around the world. You had, you know, you had as you mentioned, these different, you know, Thatcher there, in addition to Reagan and China and other parts of the world, you know, they, they were all experiencing these same trends. So why was it a uniquely U.S. phenomenon? Yeah, and the chapter is getting a lot of play as we head into an election year. It just turns out the paradigm shift is heading, occurring at the same time as a really, really contentious election and a, a shift in politics in the United States. But that's not an accident. Most finance people and kind of inside the industry look at interest rates the book is about what happens when interest rates stop going down. But there is a chapter that places the what happens when interest rates stop going down into the broader geopolitical context. And that is sadly or not so sadly, particularly relevant in 2024. And the argument is that in the 
background, for us, it's the foreground. Interest rates going down is the foreground. But for a lot of people observing the politics and economics of societies, it's kind of in the background. And what's in the foreground for them was some very significant changes that we observed in the late 70s and early 80s that have all come to an end in around 2020. So let's briefly review them. 1979, Deng Xiaoping comes to power in China. Margaret Thatcher comes to power in Great Britain. Ronald Reagan, 1980, is elected in the United States. Interest rates peak in the United States uh, in 1981. 1982, you have the securities law change that allows buybacks to occur without significant threat of being charged with share price manipulation, et cetera, and insider trading. And at roughly at the same time, NASDAQ, in the sense of both a securities platform and a, a mindset and an innovation uh, hub, is, is really getting started out, out in California in terms of companies. And uh, you have all of these factors occurring at the same time. You have the beginning of what is a 40-year period of the march of global neoliberalism, deregulation, less regulation, globalization, just-in-time supply chains, really, really f sophisticated systems to maximize efficiency. And then within finance, the buyback phenomenon is just you know hard to understate its importance because it uh, it really makes Wall Street look good. It makes senior executives uh, look good because they get to buy back their stock and push up their EPS. And you know, stock markets usually go up over time. So if you're buying back shares, it kind of makes sense. The fact that a lot of shares are issued out the back door or that the timing of buybacks can be bad is largely ignored. Everyone loves buybacks. And throughout this, interest rates are falling. Interest rates are falling. Interest rates are falling. And I, I'd say as well, Daniel, in there that it's it's, it's a good signaling methodology for CEOs as well to say, hey, well, you know, we're putting our money where our mouth is, our stock right. is undervalued, you should listen to us. Yeah. And so what if the guy is runs a grocery chain? He's an expert on the valuation of stocks. So what if it's a, a medical insurance company? They know the price of their stock. It's undervalued. Of course it's under there. They only are 50% of the time, the manufacturers of widgets. The other 50% of their time, they've got their Bloombergs open and they they absolutely certain their shares are underpriced and they're going to go out and buy them. In any case, this, and that's a topic for a separate separate day. But uh, <clears throat> this period saw an almost perfect storm, meaning clear sailing, not a storm at all, but wonderfully supportive conditions for maximizing share prices, total return, you had uh, companies able to really improve the margins. I, I looked at non-financial S&P 500 margins over the past couple of decades, and they benefited over the past 20 years, 25 years, by about 400 basis points. You, you, you couldn't get a better operating environment. Everything was going just swimmingly. Globalization, deregulation, share buybacks to help grease this, the skids of the shares, the market, et cetera, and declining interest rates, declining interest rates, declining interest rates. What role do they play? They lower the cash bar expected for returns. They also lower risk. And over a 40-year period, if you do that, if you continually lower the perceived risk and you can continually lower the perceived cash bar that you need to clear, you get to a point of, which we had largely for the past 15 years or so from the financial crisis up until recently, where there is no cash bar to sec uh, effectively zero and risk isn't much different from zero depending on how you choose to calculate it. Very, very low perceived risk environment, very low cash bar environment. In in that case, dividends don't don't play a prominent role. Share buybacks largely replace them, and investors are okay with that. They are able to fund consumption if they need to or want to through a harvested capital loss. I mean, I'm sorry, a harvested capital gain. It can be a loss, and they get used to it being a gain and just assume, and generally... Investors who do harvest capital gains to fund consumption are correct. The market goes up over time. Asset values move up over time. Therefore, it's generally generally harvesting a capital gain to fund consumption if they wish to, but it can always be a capital loss. So dividends go into the background. Share buybacks and harvested capital gains come to the foreground. Works very well for decades. Mike, I've been making the rounds the last few weeks talking about the book and with uh, I, I would say more journalists than professionals like yourself that's professional finance people getting a fair amount of pushback saying, listen, this current system works. I, I don't I don't perceive a difference between a harvested capital gain and a dividend payment. Uh, it's worked for years. Uh, and they acknowledge they're journalists, not finance people, but they follow the markets. And I said, I'm not disputing that. That, that. That's correct. But let us not 
lull ourselves into kind of a, a cons uh, not consoling, but a comforting notion that a business outcome, a dividend payment is a business outcome, is the same thing as a harvested capital gain, which is a stock market outcome. One involves the business, the other, and a profit check, it only involves the, 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 uh, the U.S. Postal Service to deliver the check in the mail. The other is a stock market outcome, which may have relatively little to do with the business, but has a lot of participants in the stock market involved in generating a harvested capital gain. They may, from an academic finance perspective, and this is something we've been discussing in the green room before, an academic finance perspective, they are you know, very much the same, but in a real world perspective, they are not. So what's the difference then? So aside from, and, and I referred a little bit to it earlier with the Canadian setting, we, have, we do have preferential tax treatment for dividends here. In the real world, what's the difference? Like, why should people not listen to the academics and say that theoretically they're the same? I think most people uh, uh, do listen to the academics and say ignore the difference. And it's a free country, at least for a while. And in a rising market, you can safely ignore the difference. But as a business owner operating through the stock market, I am not ignoring the difference. One is a business outcome, one's a stock market outcome. One can come from a private company. The other can't. If the sell the shares, imagine if every firm that anyone ever worked for, the jobs, instead of giving them some sort of store value and means of exchange, otherwise known as cash, paid them, instead only gave them a slip of paper that was a share of the business and had to be sold at the marketplace in order to buy groceries and pay the rent. That's, that's just not how businesses work. So I am more comfortable with, as a business investor going through the stock market, a dividend investor in a stock market, that the profits to fund consumption, that the cash used to fund consumption from our clients, for our clients, is generated from a business outcome, not just from a green number on a screen. There's nothing wrong with green numbers on the screen. In fact, matter of fact, Everyone is in favor of green numbers on a screen, but you cannot eat a green number on a screen. You cannot pay the rent. You cannot pay a bill with a green number on the screen. The only way you benefit from a green number on the screen is if you sell it. What a peculiar form of ownership that you have to sell the asset in order to derive any benefit from it. Whereas an income producing asset sends you the check in the mail, whether it's a private asset, publicly traded asset, real estate, et cetera. So the paradigm and the push the pushback I'm getting is that the paradigm for and this is classic stuff of being trying to be a contrarian investor. It's really become a very interesting exercise in promoting the writing the book was one thing. Promoting it's become even more interesting. The more pushback you're probably the more right you are, right? Well I'm I I'm I'm I almost wish I'd added another chapter to address this issue of what it is to be a contrarian investor. So you have a, a contrarian idea, but by its very nature it's not likely to be accepted because the existing paradigm is there sitting there and you're saying, well, this paradigm is wrong. And they say, actually, this paradigm works really well for me. I'm not, I really have no reason to agree with you because I don't see anything wrong with the existing paradigm. That's in the very nature of a paradigm. And I say, okay, fair enough. Your paradigm is 30 years old. The alternative that I represent or, or I'm trying to promote is about 5,000 years old and operates in every single market in the world other than the mature stock market of the United States. That is every mature market, every mature business setting, every unforced transaction in real estate, any time in the past couple thousand years, any private business that's being sold, they're all being sold on the cash flows that can be attributed to, to that business. The only in the United States stock market really is not the case. Now, we We've also discussed. So why do, you, why do you think that is though, Daniel? Why do you think it's just the U.S. That, that's taken this stance? Because I mean, you were describing, you got Thatcherism, you got Zhao Jinping, Xi Jinping, you got- Interest rates. You know, other, other parts of the world for the end, yeah. Well, interest rates did come down. In, Japan's really a special case because it kind of went through this uh, decades earlier. But in, the, in Western Europe and in the United States, interest rates declined in Western Europe as they did in the United States. But the other factors that we saw, the rise of buybacks, and the Silicon Valley NASDAQ phenomenon did not. So that, you know, you did see a similar lowering of risk rates and a similar lowering of cash hurdle rates, particularly in places like Germany and Switzerland, where they also got, you know, essentially negative uh, near the bottom, but even, even uh, outside of those two realms. So there was a parallel phenomenon, but it, 
in the absence of the buyback contributing cause, in the absence of the NASDAQ engine, dividends didn't disappear from European markets the way they did from the uh, from the United States market. And and we've also had, you know, Europe's had a rough row of it the last 40 years. The, the European experiment, the union experiment, got off to a good start, looked very good, but it's really struggled the last couple of decades and is struggling the last decade in particular. And so um, it's just, you know, the investors in, in Europe, when I visit with them, they're very depressed. They're, they're awfully depressed because everything's going wrong and they're they can't see, and everything's right is happening in the United States in the sense of uh, listings and and uh, innovation and so forth. So it just seems that U- the U.S. is a more concentrated the of this global neoliberal paradigm. The United States ended up in the lead, not the European Union, and all of these factors are concentrated in the U.S. It makes it, I think, also more relevant that that these factors are unwinding in the United States and that. The pendulum swung the furthest in the U.S. I think it's going to swing back the furthest as well in the U.S. You'll see it swing back less in Europe because it had not swung swung as far. I think I've, I've tortured that metaphor too much. So yeah, so that's that's a good segue because I did want to get back to like what's changed now. So so why now? What uh, is it just is it just because rates have, have moved up? The political landscape is different. Uh, and I know you talked about investing for efficiency versus efficacy, and I'd love to get into that as well. Yeah. So there are many other commentators. You can open up your newspaper or your, whatever your favorite social media platform is to get the politics, the, the new politics that are emerging to replace global neoliberalism. But boy, is something returning. So all, all of the, the political factors that, uh, that I mentioned earlier, they've all come to a you know, crash in the last couple of years. You have COVID and, and China brought an end to the global supply chain the way it had been designed, where Every company to maximize their efficiency has, you know, that one pallet coming just in time from somewhere in Asia. That that no longer is going to work. On the political side, uh, you know, with Donald Trump, Brexit, the J6 coup attempt, the continued election, uh, Trump's effort to return to office, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the neoliberal consensus globally about markets and governments has failed in the last three, four, five years dramatically. And in the background, interest rates stop going down. Again, the for market this book is for market practitioners, financial advisors, gatekeepers, and analysts. And so we got to kind of keep it a little bit closer to our or the politics part is important. It's it's really fun. It's interesting. But if you're looking for a single theme that links all the chapters in the book, it's interest rates going down. What happens when they stop going down? And then if you step back, you see, wow, interest rates going down occurred in a setting, this neoliberal, global neoliberal setting, this paradigm, where in retrospect, it was perfect for financialization of the markets, for global companies. You couldn't have imagined a, a more ideal environment. And now it's all come to a crashing end politically, economically, philosophically, and interest rates stopped going down. There's fair point or challenge is, well, what's wrong with buybacks? And actually, there's there, nothing has happened in the last four or five years to challenge buybacks. A tax was introduced, but it's fairly minor. I am a big fan of not subordinating investment policy to tax minimization policy. Even if the taxes end up being on the buyback side, ultimately one's one's investment decision should uh, enjoy pride of place. Uh, so let's not, we'll set that aside, but just say there's nothing particularly cha- an environment challenging buybacks right now. I just think the bloom is off the rose. We've had decades and decades of buybacks. They've taken all the money that used to go to dividends they are beloved on Wall Street. The academics represented in the CFA Institute and all the CFA curriculum are indifferent between a buyback and a dividend. I am not. I, you're welcome to rescind my CFA charter. I'm okay with that if that's what it comes to. So nothing wrong with buybacks in the sense that uh, there is no political challenge to them or economic challenge to them, at least not, none that I'm aware. Same thing with the innovation engine that is NASDAQ and Silicon Valley. Those companies, my, my point is simply they've now matured. And they're very, very large ones. They have plenty of cash flow. They can all make a cash distribution to company owners. So while the politics are coming to the end and interest rates have stopped going down, it's just a matter that the buyback phenomenon is what it is, but it's on in years. And uh, the uh, NASDAQ phenomenon is what it is, still a great engine of innovation. 
but uh, there are now lots of NASDAQ companies and I list them in the book. It's, you just can take the top NASDAQ, a couple hundred names and you get large, highly profitable businesses, all of who could, could pay a dividend. Yeah, it's interesting actually, because we're, uh, as you know, we're recording here in early February and, and Meta just introduced its first dividend in its history this week, which is uh, which is a pretty big, pretty big news in your world, I guess. Yeah. So I got a little bit lucky. The pub date of the book was pushed forward to January 31st by the publisher. And then on February 1st, a large social media company declares a dividend. My phone was ringing off the hook yesterday. I was pretty busy <laughs> on social media. I can't comment on individual securities, but the the timing of that was not lost on me and I had the smile. So so you make a good point there because I because I mean part of me really wants to play devil's advocate and maybe I'm one of these folks who want to ch- challenge you on on the value of a dividend versus not but cuz I get the idea of like I like the idea of being able to redeploy cash flows as as I see fit if if the if the company can't use them. So Imagine you're a, you're an alien who comes down and and you look at you know what is the what is the sort of the structural reason or the mandate of these companies. So if, if it's in, the fact that it's embedded in the business model that you would distribute cash flow out as opposed to you know if you're running a you know a growing or you know successful business you you would hope to be using all of your cash flows into positive NPV projects, growing the business and and sometimes I mean. Obviously, and you made the point that some like tech companies or growing companies earlier in their career don't have the ability to pay them out and they don't. But can you just talk, talk to that argument? I'm sure you get it every day. Yeah. So let's let's be the Martian. The Martian lands and sees minority shareholders giving over 100% of their capital without any expectation in, thing reserve, in return. And they might conclude, boy, they really trust those people they've given their money to. They don't even expect a cash payment in return. Nothing wrong with that. It's just unusual. Again, when the business is beginning and really is reinvesting every single penny, that's an absolutely fair scenario. But that doesn't apply to the hundreds of these very large public, uh, publicly traded companies very successful anymore. They make it, That, I think, is very unusual. The second thing is back to the trust part. So listen, a dividend for an equity is just a, a mechanism to balance the agency problems. Again, as a minority shareholder, what control do you have over the company? Very, very little. A dividend does provide an agency theory. There are lots of th- theories in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s about how the world works. You don't like agency theory. You don't like signaling theory. It's fine. But I, I'm I'm going to stick with agency theory. If I'm a more a minority shareholder, I would like to have some input into where the cash goes, how it's allocated. Even if the company has lots of good growth prospects, I can always reinvest the money. But I do want management to know that I'm out there as a minority shareholder. Some people don't care. They don't care about agency costs. They don't care about business ownership. Think about it. For like most of our audience, in theory, we do care. Corporate governance, fiduciary responsibilities, we we have to care about this. But many, you know, 401k people who who literally think of it just as a, what the stock market is what it is, and they couldn't care less, and they have zero interest in it. And there's nothing wrong with it. I'm not trying to persuade them. I'm just pointing out the sensibility of a business owner operating through the stock market is in favor of growth, 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 growth endlessly in favor of growth. But within reason with an agency cost and with proof, show your work, show your work. You mean your business is so good, you can't afford to pay a dividend? What kind of growth is that? You've been growing for 20 years and you can't afford to pay a dividend? Maybe you should consider a different line of business. Yeah, I was, I was thinking about it through the eyes of a, of a bondy. Like, it, I guess in a way it's kind of like a zero coupon bond with an infinite maturity, right? You're just sort of rolling the dice, right? Yeah, and I, I listen, those can be great. They're just not for me. They're just not for dividend. They're not for business owners operating through the stock market. I've been yelled at by academics saying, I don't want to be a business owner. Click. Hung up on me. So a behavioral finance professor out West. Loved it. Loved it. Absolutely so. They don't want to own anything. They don't want to think about it. They don't want to think like a business owner. But the stock market does provide a platform to be a business owner 
through the markets. If you're going to do that, then the, and it turns out that's a normal state of affairs, not just pure speculation, just let it all ride, zero coupon bond, infinite duration, let it all ride. There are lots of business owners out there who I think would benefit from treating the stock market as a business investment platform rather than a casino. And it's been harder for them the last three decades because of all these reasons where the mechanism for operating as a business owner through the stock market, as a dividend investor in a stock market, the cash payment has uh, retreated significantly. And I'm just pointing out, hey, actually, ooh, it's been a hard time. I've been <clears throat> operating as a dividend focused manager for 20 of the kind of 30 or years or so that this environment's been in place. And it's, it's, it's a boutique style as a practical matter. But as a historian, I'm saying, you know what? I know this feels like a boutique investment style right now, but it's actually uh, the uh, uh, the current environment, I think, is historically anomalous. And I think the pendulum's going to swing back more towards uh, traditional business ownership relationships over time. Some people, some investors, passive investors in particular, not paying much attention investors, will say, oh, that's great. Good, good. Don't care anyhow. I don't care. They'll say, I don't care either way. And that's fine. But the for those of us who do care, these things matter. Agency costs matter. Cash matters. So, so for the uh, for the average investor that hasn't really been paying attention, they haven't had the historian uh, glasses on, looking at the paradigm that we've been in and, and it's transitioning. So, when this paradigm happens, like how, how can the average investor uh, best capitalize on this trend of uh, of increasing dividend pairs? Yeah, I think that what's it's sort of going to play out uh, in the next few years. And you might have seen it play out with that one social media firm, uh, though the numbers, the yield of that new dividend payer is so insignificant, it, it really doesn't matter. It's more of a symbol. But with the interest rate, like back to the main theme, what happens when interest rates stop going down? Interest rates stop going down, actually moved up a little. Cash began to get a, a real return. Fixed income instruments now have circa 2024 a number you can hang your hat on, you can work with. Uh, government securities now have a yield that you can you can work with. And as an asset allocator, an exercise which would have become very, very difficult over the last 15 years because the distinguishing characteristic of, of different assets had been lost as the, in my, from my perspective, as, as the uh, cash nexus diminished. Now that the cash nexus is back, you can mix different types of income streams, cash, fixed income, government securities, real estate, private enterprises. They all have kind of mid-single digit or better numbers now. They used to have much lower numbers. But the U.S. stock market isn't there yet. As a matter of fact, the U.S. stock market's on a tear, and the yield of the U.S. stock market around 1.5%, remarkably low. Over the, How can re investors kind of benefit from this? Well, I, I'm not you know, here to discuss individual securities and who's next, which of the big tech companies are next, but they're actually going to all fall in line and begin to announce dividends. And what that means is that over time, the yield of the U.S. stock market, the payout ratio and yield, I believe, are going to rise. And investors will be able to add, not just boutique investors in the sense of uh, customers of, of the products that I manage, have a, these products have material yields, focus on dividend growth. They're part of the asset allocation exercise, but they're only a sliver of the U.S. stock market and have been for the past 20 years. I think as the U.S. stock market returns, the pendulum swings back, that investors should be prepared to see and expect and judge large tech and communication services companies and consumer companies by the same metrics that they might actually judge every other asset in terms of its present and future cash flows, something that you cannot do currently because these assets don't have cash flows, distributable cash flows. And that's going to be a game changer. It's going to make being a dividend investor in a stock market less distinctive. That's a good thing. It's going to make things a little bit harder because now, you know, uh, we have to analyze these tech giants and uh, and so forth, and at, you know, more consumer companies and types of companies that haven't historically paid dividends the last couple of decades. Uh, so it's it's but all in all, it's definitely a, a positive development. But it is going to bring equities back into the more normal realm of looking at the cash distributable cash flow of a business and figuring out what the right combination is of dividend yield, dividend growth, asset type, and mix and match them. In an exercise that one has not really applied to the U.S. stock market in decades and decades and decades.
yeah, the, the dividend discount model will uh, will finally put that to work after all these years. Yeah, you, and it's not like you have to go dig up some esoteric textbook. It's still on the first chapter of every textbook. It's amazing. Think about just, the, again, being in the nature of a contrary. The person who landed from Mars happened to land at a finance library and notices that the first chapter of every book in the library is about a D DCF or DDM and then looks at the financial markets and assets and says, I don't see any cash anywhere being distributed. How you guys all teach yourself and then you ignore it. You know, that's, that's also historically anomalous. I think that's going to come to an end and either they're going to get rid of the DCFs and DDMs or companies are going to have to start playing by the DCFs and DDMs again. And I think that latter scenario is what's going to play out. Speaking of ends, unfortunately, we're coming to the to the end of our chat here. I just have one or one final two part question for you today, Daniel. What was your first job in the industry? And if you could go back and take yourself for coffee on your first day, what key piece of advice would you offer yourself? I was a 33, 34 year old, 33 year old historian of the former Soviet Union. I showed up in Manhattan and I had some very difficult early jobs. And my number one piece of advice is before I do that ever again, really learn Excel, take some basic accounting and some basic psychology. And it's actually Excel or the equivalent. Some basic accounting and basic psychology is something that I encourage people who are considering career transitions from the humanities as I did. They're often interested in all sorts of questions. I said, no, 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 no. Here are the three things you do. Make sure you know Excel. Make sure you have basic Khan Academy accounting. You don't need anything more than that. And you might want to take a pop psychology course. Those three things will help you enormously in making the transition into business. I've been speaking today with Dr. Daniel Paris, CFA, Senior Portfolio Manager with Federated Hermes and author of the book, The Ownership Dividend, The Coming Paradigm Shift in the U.S. Stock Market. Thanks for joining us today, Daniel. It's been really great to hear your perspective. Mike, thank you for having me on the show. I'm Mike Wahlberg, and this has been Guiding Assets. <laughs>